So first of all, thank you guys for both coming along. Hello there. Hi. And first, I'll just ask you both individually what you think the biggest challenge in housing governance is today. Uh, I'll start with you, Tabitha. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very much looking forward to the conference. Uh, fingers crossed we'll all be there in person this year. Um, so great question. And when I got uh, the, the heads up on this, I thought to myself, gosh, a single greatest challenge. That is not an easy question. I'm, I'm sure Kelsey's going to come out with a, a really polished answer to this. Did you hear what you're going <laughs> to say? <Tabitha? laughs> um, I think, you know, we've I've, had, I've been asked this before and, you know, I can try and fluff around it and say there's so many different things and we're in a perfect storm of the sector and all the rest of it. But I think, you know, you, you asked me the question, I'll give you an answer. And I think it does come back to the theme around the conference, which is how we amplify the resident's voice. So I started off by thinking about the stock of our housing, uh, how the conditions are obviously, you know, we're in a real situation at the moment where we need to be improving our means by which we're, we're, we're checking our housing stock. But critically for me, it's how we're hearing about that because we have failed. We failed on how we've managed to uh, keep a view of that. We've obviously got the directions pretty much for now from the regulator to be doing stock, stock condition surveys more often. And the means by which we're going to hear about those problems is going to be through our residents. And I think that's also really critical in terms of the social housing regulation bill and the uh, the feedback that we're going to get from tenant satisfaction measures this year. And I think that's, for me, the biggest challenge is, is, is answering your question more succinctly, how we hear the resident's voice, because that's the only real effective way that we're going to establish how we meet our core purpose as a social housing provider, which is providing yeah. safe homes for our residents. Yeah, certainly. And it's it's interesting that you were having this conversation on the day that the action plan for the Better Social Housing Review has come out. I haven't had the chance to read it yet because it's literally um, been released the morning of this recording. But of course, we're going to be talking about that at the conference as well. It all it all wraps in. There's a lot to get our heads around. Um, that's one reason I'm looking forward to the event. So, Kelsey, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah, I mean, I guess definitely linkages into into Tabitha's thoughts there, really. But I, I came to the conclusion that really it was just the level of change um, that was a bit of a that was the challenge, really. And I think I think part of the challenge of governance is recognising when you need to change your strategy. Um, you know, in light of what's changing. And we see this, some, you know, we do see this sometimes when you think about merger situations where, you know, you kind of have a uh, a business case which all makes sense and then you have a sort of standstill agreement, but of course nothing stands still. And you've kind of constantly got to be thinking, well, as the operating environment changes, the macroeconomic environment has changed, you know, the, the risks are changing, your internal priorities might change, you might have, you know, some couple of maladministration notices that have just sort of come in. So you just don't, can't just sort of plough on, you know, with the same, well, that still made sense six months ago, so assume it sort mm. of still makes sense now so i think i think the the alternative is you the risk can be that you're kind of making very tactical decisions in order yeah. to address these sort of different um you know kind of crises or or just change circumstances that that are coming up and it's how to sort of be able to operate um and sort of keep the strategic you know make sure that the strategic intent is still clear and is still mm. deliverable in the midst of of change really and it and it does it does very much link into the strategic intent will need to be addressing what the priorities are for your tenants. Um, and I guess we'll come on to to talking a little bit more about that as well, won't we? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And obviously Tabith has already brought up the subject of resident voice, um, which I think we're all agreed is very relevant in this conversation. When it comes to strategy i'll just go back to you kelsey where does resident voice play into that because that's often a difficult thing to say align with i suppose the best way to put it is very practical kind of organizational goals or difficulties um yeah that might be sort of outside of kind of resident purview how does it all kind of link together i think how you uh, you know how you determine what your trade-offs and priorities are when you're talking about strategy is where 
your understanding of what is what residents value, uh, what your tenants think about, you know, your services, what their priorities are. It seems, you know, it sort of seems, um, uh, you know, it should be sort of a very guiding principle to decision making, I think, and mm. and in thinking about those priorities and, and definitely what we've seen with the swathe of V2s, which is on the agenda, you know, one of the things that we've got to think about is everybody's got less resources, they've got to make choices about how you utilise those resources. Of course, you always have had to make choices about that, but but for, for sure now, a number of organisations that were already at G2, or maybe even a quite a weak G2, are really actually in some ways that's simpler. You don't really have that many choices to make. You've got to maintain your viability and you've got to deliver essential services and make sure homes are safe. So in if you can't do that, obviously you're having another conversation, but uh, but that has to be the sort of completely accepted priority. There's, that's the non-negotiable. But yeah. beyond that, there will be choices and there will be sort of trade-offs to make. And it, I, I think that is not that is completely the the area that tenant involvement and tenant engagement can really can really help with. Um, and it, it's just it's just about, you know, it's, it's it's not been about prescriptive about the approach. I think it's more about having that as a bit of a core value, really, in, in terms of how you get your information. Just to come back on that, I completely agree with Kelsey. And I think we've got uh, we've got a lot of change coming, haven't we? We've got the Building Safety Act, which has been essentially affected yeah. and we've got the bill coming forward. Uh, we've now got the action plan for the major social housing review. And next year we're going to have another general election. We're going to probably have another housing minister, I expect. So we are going to be in this constant state of flux. So I think yeah. uh, we, we, we have to be explaining what we're prioritising to our tenants and asking them if that's all right for them to a certain extent. And I think that's that's really that 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 amplifying that voice question and having them in the yeah. room. Uh, it doesn't necessarily we'll, we'll discuss this at the conference, I'm sure, you know, how we'll affect that and how that will how will that how that happened and, and, and works. But I think those are the conversations that we absolutely need to have because then you can explain yourself to the regulator if you aren't able to do something because you've got that validation essentially, alongside meeting your statutory obligations. Yeah. yeah. And just wondering um, about some of the practicalities of that, because getting that sort of resident voice in, Noah, quite not sure if it's best to call it a traditional way of doing it is through board members. I know that some people think that's actually not necessarily the best way and you shouldn't leave it at that. What's what are your both opinions on that? Well, I think it's all of all of the options. Oh. I think you have to do all of them. So, uh, I mean, I, I you mentioned it might not be the best way. Your board has to be fundamentally driven by the skills that you need on it. That's yeah. the primary position. Uh, we've obviously got uh, the NHF Code of Governance and the Code of Conduct that um, very much pushes uh, us to ensure that we have the voice of the resident uh, influencing the strategy and change. It doesn't say that you need to have a resident on the board. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's the traditional way I've seen it is more through the scrutiny groups, through the uh, collective committee uh, involvement and the ensuring that you've got means by which that voice is amplified and, and given uh, given a, 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 a forum. But I think there's other things that we are now seeing coming forward, such as through the Best Housing, Social, through the Social Housing Review, which is ensuring your housing officers are speaking to your residents and feeding that back and mm. making sure that the complaints mechanism works empowering the ombudsman and we've now got a potential private sector ombudsman so it'll be interesting to see how that changes things and influences our sector where you know the focus has always been on the not-for-profit sector and we're now going to see it moving over to the private sector I think we've got to see all of those things happening for us to get it right and it shouldn't be yeah. where one spotlight sits. Mm. I, I think I tend to I observe lots and lots of boards you know and it, it's always for me a, a little bit of a case of look people do things differently if it works it works if it works yeah. for you and if everybody's happy that's fine um i i think i notice where it's it feels like it's um it's not working or it's not where your expectations would be so you know there's the kind of what good looks like but then there's also the flags for yeah. where things are, are not so good and i would maybe give an example of um you know, you, you can sometimes see case studies or tenants come and speak to your away day or come and speak and have sessions at meetings. But then they go and it's actually never a touched again on the agenda. So it's almost like we've given you your slot, you've come in, you've done your bit. I mean, some obviously some people do that as well as, 
involve you know the rest of the agenda looking like it involves uh, and impacts on tenants but it's not this kind of bolt-on thing that you just sort of do uh, mm. you know to, to sort of it, I can see it does help sort of set the scene and it helps get people's minds in the right place but actually it's got to come through in your papers and your decision making if you're making some decisions and it's and you've you know you've heard from your tenants but then you just go on and think right we're just going to make a whole load of other decisions where we're not even going to talk about the tenant impact or the tenant views in them there's just that disconnect isn't there and that becomes quite it's going to become more and more obvious I think yeah I mean I think this is sorry to jump in there but I think it's about triangulation (laughs) about triangulation also we need to get out and we need to see our tenants so it's it's not just about in the boardroom it's not just about in the reports it's not just about the data you know tenant satisfaction measure answers that we're going to get coming back now it's about going there and those residents will tell you if they're upset and if you're there and you're being bombarded with upset tenants you've got a real problem and it doesn't matter what your reports say nothing will take away from that and as board members and even as governance professionals who might not necessarily be on the front line get out there and and see and feel what your stock looks like because that's irreplaceable yeah and when you think about that in terms of board skills you know actually we don't probably talk enough about being able to triangulate stories you know your what you know what story have you been hearing from your management information data what story have you been hearing from your auditors and your assurance processes and what stories are you getting unfiltered from your tenants and mm. you know is there do they do they add up just that ability to sort of be able to step back or hear something and think but hang about didn't we just get you know like you know six green lights on that so it must be all right um, you know, so, yeah, I think I think as a sort of competence, you know, the sort of competencies that you're looking for for board members who are having to cope with a very broad agenda yeah. and therefore, you know, can't have loads and loads of operational detail thrown at them. Uh, how executives and uh, and company secretaries and governance people can really focus on reporting to be able to draw on those different threads and different strands to do a little bit of triangulation in advance, I think is really helpful as well. And that sort of leads into another problem that you do hear from people quite a lot is that board members nowadays can be a little bit nervous if they're getting the right information, if they're asking the right questions when it comes to a whole host of issues, not just compliance, but also how residents are doing. Is that That's something? Good. Nervousness yeah. is good. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Is this right? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes no. But I mean, is that, I suppose, particularly in your work, Kelsey, is that something you see as uh, a common frustration? Kind of what's the way to overcome that? Is it just a lot of trial and error? I think it's culture, really. Um, Really? You've got to have, uh, you know, we're moving to some of the, you you can really see the sort of more mature board behaviours changing. Um, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago where the chair said, I just want to say we need the news. We don't care. We don't have bad news or good news it's all just news and we don't expect it all to be good and I thought that was a great message actually you know and sort of starting um having being very um uh, specific and you know kind of saying saying that um up front and out loud uh, and then sort of thinking about boards not being too supervisory about this stuff and regulators I sort of think you know, Kate Dodsworth says this as well. We're we're all slight. We are slightly in this together. Uh, you know, no, we shouldn't. You, know, you can't just be too supervisory about the whole thing. I think we've got to put the problem on the table. We've got a diverse board, hopefully, with a whole load of different insights and experience. You've got that from your executive team. And what's the regulator and the ombudsman and other people saying about it? How do we solve the problems together? I appreciate there is nervousness and there is, you know can we have some more information and there is a risk of getting too operational about things and then there's a risk of people getting quite frustrated about the board members you know but you just need to take a step back and have the conversation about what do we really need here and how can we move and this I think into a good space to tag on to that that's where the role of the company secretary is so key because they need to be observing what's going on in that boardroom and they need mm. to be supporting their chair to realize that the board dynamics are yeah. there and that therefore if someone's nervous or if they're not speaking there needs to be an opportunity for that conversation to be had um you know we we all might 
feel that we don't want to you know you have a you have a boardroom where you have a we have a relationship with your peers and you know you might want to not embarrass yourself or embarrass someone else but fundamentally as board members as directors you have statutory obligations and those have to come first and your governance framework needs to be there to support that so that you do feel that you can ask the question and asking a question as Kelsey says is the first part of being a board member I think is you you find out what you need to know for you to be able to take a, a position. Yeah and it comes back to skills and expectations again really because um, there are ways of asking those questions yeah, you just see they're, re they're really good board members who can ask the most difficult questions and you know make very pertinent points but do it in such a way that it's not threatening and it's not you know they get what they need and they make the point and it's just a real it's a skill isn't it and it is something which I think when you know we're kind of looking at what we're looking at board development is not all about technical skills and it's all you know there is there's quite a you can you can buy quite a lot of your technical skills and you know whatever but there is there is something there about making sure that you know what good assurance looks like and that you're quite tenacious about getting it but in a way that is supportive supportive challenge is my benchmark I think. Yeah and um, I know that board succession planning on the agenda for housing governance as well. Uh, one other thing on the agenda is shaping the future of our sector, thinking what that will look like. I know we're ending the conference on that. So mm. the last few years have been quite turbulent. I don't necessarily want anyone to play Nostradamus, but what do you both think the future of governance looks like, particularly in the kind of short and medium term? I'll ask you first, Tabitha. Mm, um, well, I think. I'm going to come back to the general election because I think that there's going to be change there. And I know that we've had a rhetoric in previous years about development and about needing to increase the housing stock because we have a shortage, which is 100 percent true. And we do have a housing stock um, yeah. shortage. I think having said that, that might have influenced our views and we've been concentrating on building, building, building. I think now we are looking much more at regeneration and I think that's where yeah. we will be going over the next 12 months to 18 months, looking at our current stock, looking at ensuring that we are investing enough in that. It's certainly true from the Building Safety Act perspective. Um, so I think that's where our focus will move. I think that's certainly true as we start to hear from the results from tenant satisfaction measures and we prepare for further regulation potentially and further act action from the regulator going forward. Um, longer term, I think the for-profits are moving more into this sector and I think that's affecting the financial position and the investment perspective of, of yeah. where we are. So uh, I'm not a finance person please but I, I do recognise that the perception of the sector and also potentially the complexity of the governance arrangements is increasing as we go forward and there'll be more players and different perspectives that we might need to take into consideration. That's interesting. Um, Kelsey, same question. Well, very, very much fitting in, really. I, I think um, I think it will improve. I think governance will improve because it always has. You know, we've been on a, a real tra trajectory for the, you know, years that I've been in, 30 something years that I've been uh, working in in housing and governance has improved. And I think we can you know, you can look back at rose tinted glasses and say, oh, well, it was all about the tenants in the past and governance has kind of, you know, gone awry. But actually, honestly, my my early days of walking into board meetings was that everybody was quite half cut um, because they all had glasses of wine before they started to make any decisions. Lady Annette was out telling the unmarried mothers about how to live their lives. You know, it was not all, you know, sunshine and flowers. There was quite a lot of poor governance and very poor behaviours and there are still some poor behaviours and you know obviously it's not all perfect but I do think we have improved massively and there's no reason to suggest that things won't continue to improve and yeah we're in very challenging times but actually you know makes us stronger um, and makes us you know it's only going to be for the good I think um, so going to Tabitha's point, I think the, the key thing, um, the key word for me is accountability to stakeholders. Mm. Um, and, how, you know, I think it's really important that boards think about who is it that they're accountable to 
what do they need from them and are they delivering it and sort of fundamentally if you're trying to cut through a bit of noise really sort of understanding who you're part of you obviously your tenants as your key stakeholders but what are your staff needing you know what are the partners partnerships with others you know for profits or, or whatever um local authorities the wider community and regulators of course so the, there's no um I think that's the link with the rise of the senior independent director as well, that sort yeah. of stakeholder accountability um, role and the and the SID is going to be really important going forward. If you haven't got a SID, um, you know, come and talk to us because we've got a lovely little SID network going on and they're all fabulous. <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> right. Um I suppose just to sneak in one more question then why do you think that uh well i suppose two questions why why is the housing governance conference that the nhf does important why is it particularly important this year and whoever wants to jump in on that can do well first of all i think we didn't have a chance to meet in person last year we had this yeah. you know the situation where it, sadly because of the rail strikes um we we weren't in person and i think for those people that there were were there last year, it was fantastic. But I I still feel that we're coming out of that period, and so yeah. it'd be great for us to be together in a room. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, it's a very distinct conference in terms of those governance professionals, but we also have board members and an opportunity for us to yeah. share those best practices. So the person in person piece is really important for me. I think the agenda itself everyone's got the opportunity to have a look at is fantastic. We're hearing from Kate Dosworth again uh, at a really critical time uh, when we're seeing so much uh, coming forward and we will need to hear what the regulator is going to be doing in response to the bill. So I think it'll be great to hear what she can tell us about that. And we've also got so many other things and obviously Kelsey has been involved in, in formulating the agenda, but it does feel at the moment, and I think Kelsey and I were discussing this earlier, that you look at the headlines and it's all rather doom and gloom, isn't it? It's rather, you know, everyone's getting to, into problems. I think one of the good things about a conference such as this is that the agenda will certainly help us to address how we need to react and how to respond to those. But we will be asking what's the best practice and having that opportunity to talk to each other, to share what we're doing and to take something away from that so that we can embed it. 100%. So Tabitha and I met up with two other women that we only really met through the conference um, a couple of years ago now, maybe, I think it was. And we just get, you know, we get together and you come away with like a 100 ideas, you know. So for me, that's the benefit of conferences. You just sort of get together with people that are, you know, grappling with similar things to yourself. Governance teams tend to be quite small and yeah. sometimes you really just need that space to just give yourself that bit of time for reflection and time for thinking. It's just worth the weight in gold. What great value for money. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Um, We'll wrap it up there. Uh, I'll just say that Housing Governance 2023 is on the 22nd of June. It is online and at the Royal College of Physicians in London. If you go to governance.housing.org.uk, you can see all the details there, and we hope to see as many people there as possible. So Tabitha Kassam, Kelsey Walker, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.